And welcome everyone to today's event, Beyond Palomira, Shaping the Future of Open Access Book Policymaking. Uh, my name is Lucy Barnes. I'm an editor and outreach coordinator at Open Book Publishers, which is a scholar-led non-profit open access book publisher. Um, we're part of the Palomira project. And I'm also a coordinator of the Open Access Books Network, which is um, co-hosting this event with Palomira. Um, and the session today is partly to uh, sort of explore what Palomira has done in the last two years. We've since January 2023, uh, we've been operating to find out why so few open access policies include books and then to provide actionable recommendations to change this. Um, we're coming towards the end of that project now. Um, so Niels is going to go through what we've done as a project and the resources and recommendations that we've created. But the main purpose of today's event isn't to sort of look backwards and say, well, what's the project done? It's to look forwards and say, well, now that these resources and recommendations exist, um, how might they be used and how might the people on this call and also, um, you know, obviously many, many people who aren't here who represent different stakeholder groups in different countries, how might uh, these resources and recommendations be used to support um, a policy shift towards open access books? Um, so before we go into the meat of the session, just very briefly, in case you're not aware about the Open Access Books Network, who we are um, and what we do. We're a, an open community for everyone to discuss and learn about open access books. Um, we bring together different stakeholder groups. It's not for any one particular group. It's for everyone to sort of exchange um, and learn more about open access books. We've got a website um, where you can, that's the kind of hub of our activities. You can find out what we're doing and how to keep in touch with us there. We've got a mailing list, a knowledge commons group where we can have online discussions and a Blue Sky account as well, where we broadcast what we're doing. Um, we post events and webinars like this. We share blog posts. We have different resources available. Um, and we basically try to be a, a bit of a community hub um, for anyone interested in open access books. So if you want to be more involved, um, if you want to, uh, for example, propose an event or write a blog post or see a resource that we're missing, um, please get in touch with us. We're always really happy to hear from anyone who's interested in engaging with the network. We're coordinated by Open Book Publishers, which is my involvement, um, by OAPEN, DOAB and by Spark Europe. And we're a member of, um, we're an Opera 6 special interest group. Um, so Opera is another way to engage with us and with what we're doing. Um, in terms of today's plan of action, um, after this short welcome, we're then going to hear from Neil Stern, who's the Managing Director of the OAPEN Foundation and the PI of the Palomira Project. Um, and he's going to lay out uh, in broad terms what the project has done and the resources and recommendations that we've created. And then there'll be opportunity for you all to ask questions of Neil's. Uh, after that, we'll move into breakout groups um, where we're going to ask some quite broad questions to try and get uh, some discussion going about the trajectory of open access book publishing in broad terms, about how policy can support that and how the resources that Palomira has created and the rec recommendations that Palomira has made can feed into that progress. Um, then we're going to come back into the main room for some sort of summarising of what's been discussed in each room um, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, and say goodbye for the afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and uh, hand over to Niels. Niels, if you'd like to present. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thanks for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will, as Lucy said, uh, share with you what we have done in the Palomira project. And as you can see here, Palomira is uh, short for policy alignment of open access monographs in the European research area. So it says um, it's a it's a project uh, looking at policies, looking at alignment, looking at uh, monographs, so academic books, peer reviewed books, and it's focusing on on the European research area, which is a bit wider than than uh, the European Union, and. Uh, I'm going to give you just a brief overflight of of uh, how we've done this and and what has come out of it as we are approaching the end because this is a project that uh, as Lucy said began in January 2023 so it's a two year project which means that it ends uh, this year uh, in 2024 and uh, we wanted to 
we were called to understand uh, the landscape. So uh, really understanding why so few open access funder policies include books, uh, both research funders and research institutions uh, don't uh, often mention books. And, and we were trying to understand why. Uh, but first of all, we would have to uh, uh, look at the whole landscape. And then to come up with evidence-based and actionable, uh, actionable recommendations uh, to change this situation. So we are uh, 16 members of the project consortium. It's uh, coordinated by OPRAS and OAPEN has been the scientific coordinator. And um, yes, so this has been what we've been up to for, for the past two years. And uh, just a few words on the methodology. Um, the methodology was so that first we went out, uh, we collected knowledge from 39 countries. We were researching in 39 countries, uh, collecting documents, uh, but also doing interviews, surveys, and, and other things to understand the landscape. Then we had our first validation event exercise where we invited experts from all stakeholder groups to look into the knowledge base that we uh, were creating and to identify if we were missing uh, missing documents and that helped us add more documents and 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 increase our understanding of the landscape then uh, based on all that uh, data collection uh, all that research data we did the analysis and that was uh, a very uh, um, a vast, uh, comprehensive analysis. Uh, and I'll show you uh, uh, a bit more about that as well. Um, we had a, another type of validation event for, for the analysis, a kind of a, um, a, a more focused, in-depth uh, uh, review of the analysis. And then on top of that uh, data, on top of that uh, research, we came up with 42 recommendations that um, uh, are actionable and that I will also show a few of these um, in a moment. And we've also engaged the community again uh, through the third validation event where we uh, shared the, the recommendations and, and got uh, feedback from uh, a broad range of stakeholders, also from some uh, umbrella organizations like uh, LIBA and the European Universities Association. Right, so the key results and uh, in the European Commission terminology, the key exploitable results, meaning uh, what can be used, uh, what, how can uh, the, the outcomes of the project be used, be exploited. And this is, of course, also thinking about uh, what are, um, what are the, the, the potential of, of the project results beyond Palomera. So we have... Uh, uh, five key results that I've put here. Of course, there have been many other results, um, not least that we, uh, as a project consortium, have generated a lot of awareness in our own networks around the project, and the project as such has also been communicated uh, wide and far uh, due to all the work that has been taking place in, in, in the work package related to uh, the communication activities. Um, and engagement activities as well. So um, the knowledge base is, is one of the key uh, results, uh, the research, the recommendations. Then we have conceptualized a policy development tool and we have uh, established a funder forum. And I will go through each of these uh, with a few more details. So the knowledge base is where we added all uh, the findings of of the of the data collection. Uh, so in the knowledge base, there are around uh, 650 documents. Um, 250 more or less are policy, uh, open access policy documents of which some include books, uh, but definitely not all. And uh, these are both policies coming from institutions and from research funders. Uh, next to the, the policy documents, we have what we would call policy-related documents, so contextual documents that are uh, interesting if, if you are interested in, um, in, in this area, of course. So all these documents uh, are available in the knowledge base. It's an open, uh, open source repository, and, um, and they, uh, it's, you can uh, browse by subject, so you can see, for instance, per country. 
Uh, and just in a second, I will. there will be a short demonstration video so you can see how it works. But I would also point out that uh, we have related, uh, we have connected this knowledge base with the existing uh, Open Access Books Toolkit that OAPEN is coordinating. And so that toolkit, which was uh, originally focusing on authors and open access book publishing now also has a section on uh, funding and policy making. So that uh, toolkit, which consists of uh, 50 short articles on OA book publishing, now also holds some 10 articles focusing on uh, policies and funding. Um, and that those articles uh, come from, from the analysis that uh, was part of the project. So now I'm going to uh, show you a very short uh, video of uh, how, to, how to navigate the, the toolkit. Uh, sorry, the knowledge base, of course. The knowledge base is a toolkit that collection of hundreds of documents related to open access book policies in the European research area. There are several ways in which you can search this database. You can browse by the date when a document was published, by a document's author, you can browse by its title, or by its subject. Here you will find an overview of all documents that are in the knowledge base pertaining to a specific country. For instance, here you will find a list of all Austrian documents available in the knowledge base. If you'd like to refine the search and combine more filters, return to the main page and type in a keyword in the search box. For instance, carte, the word for book in Romanian. On the left-hand side, you can apply different filters to refine the results. You can select and choose Romanian documents put forth only by research funding organizations. You can then download the document as a PDF or have a look at the excerpts available that highlight passages related to books and provide translations with Deeple. Explore the knowledge base and find many more documents published by different stakeholders or look at the interviews of stakeholders across the European research area. Right, so that was the knowledge base. And uh, if there are any research funders or uh, research organizations, uh, performing organizations uh, on this call, we of course invite uh, all who have policies uh, to uh, send them to us so we can add them to the knowledge base. We're currently figuring out uh, an easy workflow so that um, that institutions and, and funders themselves can upload uh, policies to, to the knowledge base to keep it up to date. Right, so the, the research part, uh, I, I won't go into details, but uh, just to, well, first of all, give you the link here through the QR code to, to the report, which is on Synodo but also to point out that uh, some of the research were, was looking into key policy elements. So basically um, trying to find out which elements should be addressed in any policy. So that's a way of, of thinking alignment is that any policy should uh, address a certain, uh, certain types of, of uh, elements like uh, the OA models, like rights and licensing, like funding, compliancy, uh, and so on. And this is not to say that all policies should then look the same, not at all. It's just saying that you need to address these different aspects, these different elements uh, in your policy, because they will be important for others to uh, uh, interpret your policy. And some of the the the, the sort of key observations uh, that that came out of of this, a lot more came out, I, I should say, immediately, and and you'll see in the report. But just some some observations, uh, looking at at the many policies. So, for for example, that a fundamental fundamental challenge was that uh, many open access policies explicitly do not in, include books. So um, this was, uh, let's say, confirming what we thought, um, but also that many policies were vague in language and structure about how uh, books uh, are included. So it's, uh, you know, that has, you'll see in the recommendations that we ask, that we, we recommend that, that books should be, if they are part of the policy, they should be explicitly mentioned. Often uh, policies refer to all publications, something kind of vague um, without specifically mentioning books. Also funding and support mechanisms for OA books were often unclear 
or not mentioned. Uh, and of course, that is, is, is very important uh, 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 to any policy. And then finally, that we found that policies were often uh, outdated uh, and lacked information with respect, with respect to uh, review and update cycles. So um, if you find policies that are um, more than five years old, you wonder when it will be updated. And if you can't find information about that, that uh, will, will be um, uh, giving you perhaps uh, questions about the validity of, of the policy. Um, right, so looking at the recommendations, so as I mentioned, we based our recommendations on the findings of the project, so they're evidence-based, and uh, we made them actionable, and so each recommendation uh, is, is time, um, has, has a time uh, recommendation, so short, medium, long-term. And uh, we did uh, 42 recommendations all in all. Uh, some were specific for these institutions, uh, for these stakeholder types. So institutions, funders, uh, national policymakers, libraries, researchers, scholarly societies, open uh, infrastructure providers and publishers. But we also made some recommendations that were general. Uh, and the five uh, you see here are that, uh, that uh, we recommend to address uh, open access books specifically in, in OA policies. Also to use simple language, which is not oft, uh, always the case um, in the policies, to raise awareness about uh, OA books at all levels, to consider funding funding mechanisms uh, for OA books that are um, uh, that do not involve uh, book processing charges, and also to engage in collaboration with related stakeholders. So these are uh, the high level recommendations. And then uh, we've done also five recommendations that specifically target the key uh, stakeholders for the project. So the European Commission asked us to specifically look at, um, at uh, research funding and research performing organizations. And we've also included uh, policymakers generally for these uh, recommendations. So to consider appropriate reward and recognition uh, mechanisms for OA books, to provide appropriate mechanism, uh, funding mechanisms for OA books, uh, to put in place mechanisms that monitor OA book policies, and uh, to develop awareness about rights and licenses, and last but not least, to contrib contribute to improving the infrastructure for open access books. So next to these general uh, recommendations, we have uh, the specific ones for um, for the different eight stakeholder groups. I won't go into those, but you can have a look at the full report, uh, which is um, uh, you can see through this QR code. Then, uh, fourthly, we um, conceptualized. So we we uh, we described as an idea a tool. We didn't develop it, but described it as an idea, a policy development tool, which uh, is basically taking all. Uh, the evidence uh, and the research and the recommendations into one uh, pot and then uh, out of that uh, derive what we would see as a navigational tool for policymakers. So that's why we call it the OA book policy compass. It's, it's kind of helping you as a policymaker when writing your policy, but also when implementing your policy to, uh, um, to remember or, or to find a way through that process. And this is where the research uh, on, on the key policy elements is very important because it will take you through all the policy elements that we found as important uh, when writing policies and then the elements that are important when implementing the policy. And here I, I just mentioned a few. Of course, there are many more uh, elements, but the idea would then be to, to create some kind of web-based um, uh, navigational tool so that uh, both those who are actually uh, writing the policy, but also those who are strategically taking decisions about the policy and, and their implementation uh, could, uh, could be helped through that uh, process. And, uh, and we only promise to, to uh, come with, with the concepts uh, for this project, but we hope that the idea will be picked up by policymakers after the project. So beyond project, that it could be um, become a, a real tool. And one way in which we hope it could become a real tool is through the fifth and, and final uh, project outcome that I will mention here, which is the, uh, the Funder Forum. So the Funder Forum was uh, an essential uh, resource that we created uh, during the project. 
So we basically invited uh, research funders and, and some uh, other policymakers uh, from the European research area to convene and share knowledge, share experiences, discuss challenges, in a trusted forum. So we had uh, during the project three such online meetings and one in-person uh, workshop with uh, with these funders. And uh, we held those meetings uh, respecting the Chatham House rule so that it was a trust-based uh, forum where, uh, where the representatives of the different uh, uh, organizations could could uh, speak freely. And uh, throughout the project, uh, we had representation from 24 countries, so a quite broad representation. And uh, when we had our final uh, in-person workshop, uh, we it was clear that the participants um, found value in this um, in this forum. And so therefore, we've now, uh, we are in the process of uh, finding a way to sustain it and and this is uh, what we are um, doing now uh, so basically um, science europe coalition s and open are looking into uh, how we can continue this uh, coordinate this as as within the science europe uh, framework supported by um, other organizations like spark europe uh, operas and and others so um I think uh, we'll see by the end of January where we have hopefully um, had a successful process with creating this policy forum for open access books. And we call it policy forum to show that we, we want to include not only research funders, but also uh, research uh, performing organizations, universities, uh, other research institutions and, and national policymakers. So it should be uh, an open forum for uh, with the focus with o open access books in focus in in a um, in a dialogue with the wider community. So it's it's very exciting uh, as an outcome of the project to have such a dedicated forum where we can continue uh, to discuss, but also to develop uh, resources like the policy development tool, uh, like the knowledge base. Right, so this is just the final slide uh, to show you that uh, there is a before and a beyond uh, Palomera. So uh, the before um, are some of the, it's a non-exhaustive list of, of projects that uh, have related to open access books. There are actually not that many projects, I, I should say, but, um, but European funded, but also some US funded and, and, uh, and also knowledge exchange funded. Uh, activities um, um, more or less when open library was was launched in 2000 or was begun as a project in 2008 and then uh, throughout there have been uh, many different projects so palomera is is here but already uh, next uh, next year in january uh, the eu funded almasi project which is on diamond uh, open access will include uh, a small part on books the graphia project uh, also has a as a part on on books. So there are future projects and hopefully there will be more because there's a lot more to do. And um, we will be uh, uh, launching or issuing a, a, a final policy brief from the project uh, end of this year, where we um, will sort of summarize the findings, the results, but also um, pick up some of our own recommendations to say, well, these are areas where we could see that as a community, we could do uh, a lot more and uh, hopefully we'll find opportunities uh, to do that. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention and um, happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Niels. Um, if anyone has questions for Niels, feel free to um, drop them in the chat or you can also raise your hand because I can, uh, see uh, who's raised their hand, I think, on Zoom to ask you to uh, ask a question verbally. Um, while people are gathering their thoughts, um, I've got a question, Niels. Um, I noticed in the recommendations the word appropriate comes up. Um, so, for example, appropriate funding mechanisms. And so <clears throat> I was just wondering, do you have, do Palomira offer um, guidelines or, or suggestions for how people can decide what appropriate means in their context? Wow, that's a very good question, Lucy. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, 
that is that is a very difficult question exactly because the the Europe is a very I mean we have this we have uh, researched uh, only the European research area but it's a very diverse uh, region uh, looking into 39 countries uh, we we thought we would find we thought actually we could cluster uh, the region into like five or six clusters but even that was was uh, too broad I would say so the diversity is really quite uh, significant and this is of course also true when it comes to funding so um, so I don't I don't think it's really um, possible to to say what appropriate is but I think by looking into the different policies that we have in the knowledge base you will find examples that can help you um, see you know what could be possible and uh, we during the during the funder forum meetings we did have such conversations where some of the funders shared that the way they had uh, come up with policies and funding levels and funding mechanisms was indeed by uh, by researching other policies so i think that would probably be my best uh, <laughs> answer to to look at uh, uh, what is out there already and and for that the knowledge base is is really very convenient because it's it's a very comprehensive resource for for exactly that Are there any other questions for Niels or thoughts that people wanted to share? Um, another question about the recommendations that I had was, what's the sort of timeline that you're envisaging for people to implement the recommendations? Have you got a timeline in mind or are there certain things people can do straight away and then other things that will take longer? Or Yes, so... Uh... We tried as best as possible to uh, give some time estimates, and and I mentioned the the short, medium, long term, and we defined uh, short term to be like one to two years, and and medium to be three to four uh, three to four years, and then then long term would be uh, longer, um, and so you can see uh, by recommendation uh, what we would imagine uh, would be you know feasible short term. And and actually, quite a lot of the recommendations are pretty are very much short term. I think, um, actually, you know, lots of the recommendations are already being um, performed. So if you look around, um, they are being practiced uh, already, uh, and and so I think there's also a lot of um, experience from institutions around uh, Europe, but also beyond Europe, where where people can. Piece, easily pick up um, uh, others' experience and and then uh, um, set things in, uh, set things into motion uh, fairly quickly. Um, I mean, race awareness is something you can do uh, quite easily, or you can uh, begin um, uh, reaching out to other stakeholders, which is another recommendation to to gain uh, to gain some some experience and, and knowledge about how to get started if if you haven't. Uh, if you don't know how to get started so i think there are, there are lots of low-hanging fruits basically uh, that can sort of uh, get you off the ground if if you want to thanks niels and there's a question in the chat from kevin sanders um kevin says policy is often thought of as a stick the reduction of oa to compliance has in my experience been very difficult to handle when creative positive narratives at the local level um, of course, the carrot could be the material benefits for scholars in the wider world. Have Palomira done much outreach to organisations such as Coara? It would be great to have synergies in the wider field. Yeah, thanks, Kevin, for for this comment. This is very valid, and actually, it's it's one of our recommendations to for uh, for research uh, funding and performing organisations to consider uh, reward and recognition mechanisms and Quara would be uh, uh, would be the obvious forum to engage with and i hope that uh, through the policy forum that we uh, intend to establish and i hope we will be successful in establishing we could have these uh, relationships uh, moving forward the the policy forum um, we have defined some some uh, initial objectives for the for the forum to get started and then hopefully uh, we'll see uh, things evolving naturally but but i would i would see within the the next uh, 
you know, one to three years, uh, a lot of activity in the area and, and organizations like Quara, but also uh, Konosk and, and other organizations where we could uh, liaise and, and, um, and have, uh, you know, uh, broadly speaking, more focus on, on OA books and, and also to exactly um, create these, these uh, positive narratives. I think we even, you know, with the Open Access Books Toolkit, we, we have tried to also uh, showcase these uh, positive uh, narratives through author, author success stories and, and otherwise show the, the positive impacts of, of uh, publishing OA as opposed to non-OA. Of course, there is a lot of uh, cultural um, uh, change involved in this, and and this has been the case for for many years, right? Uh, and and I I think uh, actually uh, some of the events that have been held uh, throughout the project for uh, by also by the OA Books Network showed that um, publishing open access uh, books in the humanities is no longer a strange thing. It's actually uh, quite a, a normal thing. It's it's about the funding and about um, about the, the 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 logistics of it. So I think that's that's a change. That's a big change uh, if you compare with ten years ago. So so I think the there is a there is an understanding uh, that that there is some it it makes sense to publish open access. It's more about the the how to do it and I think policies clear policies that are clear about the funding as well help uh, authors. Uh, do this right and it makes it more like the normal thing to do